Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Manning, and welcome to the Art of Pharma and Biotech Deal Making panel discussion. And thank you in advance to our expert panelists. Um, I have been in the industry for over 25 years now. I spent the first 14 years of my career at AbbVie commercializing Humira. Uh, I then moved to Human Genome Sciences to work on the launch of Benlista. Um, for the past 10 years, I've spent my career in CDMOs. I've worked for some of the world's largest, such as Lanza, Patheon, and Fujifilm Dyson and Biotechnologies, as well as some startups uh, like Alchemy, Loria Biopharma, and most recently, I was head of global strategic partnerships at Center for Breakthrough Medicines. I also have the privilege of working with Eric and Nancy as a strategic advisor at Kitaro Therapeutics. Um, maybe if the panelists can please give quick intros, then we'll get started. Sure. Start here. Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Beth White, and I've been in the Philadelphia area as a biopharma executive for more than 30 years, so very much um, grounded in what's happening in Philadelphia. Um, spent a long time at Wyeth and Pfizer, 20 years, so um, a lot of my career has been on the big pharma side, but in the last five years, I've transitioned into the startup environment uh, in the gene therapy space, so I've worked for a couple of very early stage startup companies, um, including one that I'll tell you a little bit more about later. But um, you know, with regard to this panel and thinking about deal making between pharma and biotech, I've had experience kind of from both sides of the table. So I bring a little bit of that Not perspective. Not usually, but you never know. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Moran. Um, I work for Johnson and Johnson Innovation oh, Center, so based sure. out of uh, Boston. Um, I've been in the industry for 30 years, I and, um, and I currently support um, early innovation therapies um, on the platform uh, side of things as well as oncology um, for the East Coast. Hi, nice to see everybody here. Ranjani Shreetan. I work for Bayer Oncology, do business development and licensing. Molecular biologists by Gordon Caton have done a fair bit of business strategy roles for small size pharma and biotech. Nice to be here. Hello, everybody. Uh, Joe Labarge, uh, the CEO of Apertura Gene Therapy. Uh, we're a, a small gene therapy company currently headquartered in New York. So don't hold that against me here on the panel. Uh, prior to becoming uh, CEO of Apertura, I spent uh, eight years at Spark Therapeutics uh, here in, in Philadelphia, both as chief legal officer and chief business officer. Um, and so looking forward to chatting about uh, the art of deal making. Thank you. Um, so as we all know, biotech and pharmaceutical partnerships play a <coughs> crucial role in the drug development and commercialization life cycle. These important relationships help address complex challenges of drug discovery, development, and commercialization of innovative treatments and life-saving therapies. Um, today's discussion will highlight trends in partnering. Uh, we'll look at some strategic alignment initiatives and the importance of when and how to engage and we'll share resources that are available to our biotech startup community and some best practices. Um, Colin, Beth, and Joe are also going to share some incredible success stories and we'll conclude with the Q&A. Um, so I just wanna kick off the discussion with highlighting some of the, several of the key trends in biotech and pharma partnering and a few of the recent notable 2023 deals. Uh, the rise in complexity of, of drug development, accelerating innovation, diverse drug portfolios, risk sharing, regulatory challenges, global expansion, and M&A are a few of the key trends. Um, with regards to the notable deals, um, Vertex's non-exclusive licensing agreement with CRISPR Therapeutics to expedite the development of its hypoimmune cell therapies to treat type 1 diabetes, AstraZeneca's rare disease subsidiary Alexion Pharmaceuticals $1 billion agreement to acquire Pfizer's early stage gene therapy portfolio, and then Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of J&Js entering into a worldwide collaboration and licensing agreement with Cellular Biomedicine Group for a pair of cell therapy CAR-T candidates. And we're likely going to see more announcements before the end of the year. Um, so for the panel, um, if you could please share from your perspectives, you know, how do you see the pharma and biotech deal making environment evolving? You want me to start? Please. Yeah, sure. Um, we, as Jen mentioned, you know, I think <clears throat> there's a lot of things happening. Um, in addition to some of these deals that you've been talking about that have been occurring over, over this course of this year, I mean, every time you pick up the news, I, I pay a lot of attention to the gene therapy space. You see 
another deal. Um, just in the last couple of days, uh, AstraZeneca did a deal with Verve Genomics. I think it was a $42 million upfront um, for identification of neurodegenerative um, targets, you know, possibility for $840 million in milestones plus royalties. See another deal a couple of days ago from Matsuka. Um, and, you know, so I think there's a lot of things happening. You know, we've heard today, and I'm sure everybody's well aware of, you know, what's happening in the financing world, you know, from a venture capital perspective, you know, the IPOs are down. So I think everything feels a bit depressed, but I would say from my perspective, it seems that the partnerships, M&A, business development deals between biotechs and pharma are still really pretty quite strong. I think it's seeing a little bit of, um, you know, trends in certain directions. I think the bar's a little bit higher, um, not only for venture capital investment, but also for deal making, you know, where companies are hoping to see things de-risked a little bit further. For example, perhaps looking for in vivo proof of concept data, you know, perhaps even clinical data. Um, so, you know, you see some, some things sort of adjusting, maybe upfront payments are a little bit lower. Um, you know, when you look at sort of the therapeutic areas that are of interest, I think cell and gene therapy has been a really hot area for partnerships in M&A. And I, I think that's, you know, cooled off a little bit, but still quite strong, especially when you look at things like newer platforms like gene editing and um, platforms that are supportive of cell and gene therapies. Um, I think oncology continues to be quite a strong area. and. Maybe more on the newer side, um, AI-directed um, drug development, I think, are some, some of the kind of hotter areas. So that's, that's how I see, sort of generally speaking, the trends. Yeah, maybe to key in on the, the bar being a little bit higher, from, mm -hmm. at least from the J&J &J perspective. Um, I think that um, it, certainly there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of activity on, on the licensing side of things and M&A, et cetera. So that's, it's good to see that continuing to, to uh, generate momentum. Um, but uh, I would say, you know, with respect to, you know, Johnson & Johnson, you know, we're looking at um, areas that, um, that are, you know, core to our focus. And so there is that money there, uh, the, the big money there for, um, for licensing deals. Um, and the cellular biomedicines deal, I think, is a fantastic example for that because, you know, we already have um, a franchise in cell therapy. This allows us to expand. Um, that, that franchise and invest more in that, in that space. Um, perhaps maybe seeing a little bit less um, of, of uh, dollars spent out in the periphery from you know, companies' core strategies. Um, and I would say maybe another, um, another, key, um, another key trend that, that we're seeing is that uh, bio biotechs are becoming uh, more reliant upon um, the business development deal. Um, as, uh, as the financial situation is, is still trying to work its way through. Um, and so that, that can often uh, provide some tension with respect to the, to the deal terms, to the deal values that we would see um, as the, the, financial, um, the, the financial impetus, the financial strategy is becoming as important, if not more important, than the, than the strategic objectives. Um, for companies like Johnson & Johnson, we're fortunate to have um, you know, a, a corporate venture arm. So we can, uh, we can leverage that to help try and build that, bridge that gap. Um, and so that, that's a useful tool for us in order to, to help, um, you know, get these deals to, to, uh, to move forward. Um, and, but I would, I would caution that, you know, the, the valuations uh, these days are, are not, as, uh, not as robust as we would see a couple of years ago. So it's, it's a matter of setting expectations um, using, th there's an opportunity there for, for this as a tool, but, but managing those expectations on, uh, on what those valuations might look like. So, yeah. so um, I could provide a little may maybe more color on the, the gene therapy space, because uh, I've been in that for the last, last 10 years. I think I would certainly echo the comments of, of Colin and Beth. Um, I think the way, the way, the trends that I've been seeing also are you've got an, a number of, a, a lot of gene therapy companies that are either close to the clinic or in the clinic that are struggling to raise cash. Um, and so I think you see opportunistic uh, deal making around um, either acquisitions or whole, wholly licensing those programs to 
larger pharma players and others that can f further fund their development. And that's at a, at a time when, when those companies are, are strapped for cash and the public markets are not very receptive to them raising more capital to advance those programs. And then I think the other end of the kind of the spectrum is kind of new technologies, right? And I think you see still a lot of investment on early licensing deals for things that may be earlier in Collins pipeline or, or elsewhere where they want new delivery technologies, new payload technologies, new gene editing technologies. And so I think you're seeing still a, a lot of uh, momentum in kind of that new technological space. And as we move in the gene therapy space, I think from really kind of first generation technologies to second and third generation mm -hmm. technologies, um, I think that's where you're seeing still a lot of interest and a, and a lot of investment. And I would certainly also, you know, echo the comments of, of you know, utilizing business development as a, as a financing tool for smaller companies. Um, the capital markets, you know, I still, I still truly believe that, you know, really good science um, and, and good management will attract capital, but it's a tough environment out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, hopefully that will continue to thaw um, and maybe bring a little bit less tension to the, uh, the dynamic between the, um, the, my companies and the companies of Colin and Beth and Rangita, uh, Rangitas. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that, I think that's, that's still gonna play out over the course of, of 2023 and 2024. Thank you very much for those insights. Um, one of the things we discussed while preparing for this panel um, that really bubbled up to the top was the importance of strategic alignment and early engagement. Um, can you please share how biotechs can best align their assets or technologies to a form of strategic roadmap and share your thoughts on when and how early engagement should begin? Um, I can start. Um, so, so at the innovation center, so we have innovation centers throughout the globe. Um, we also have our, um, our incubators as well. We've got a number of, uh, of J labs um, throughout the globe as well. Um, and we put these, these organizations in place so that we can meet um, the, the innovators you know, at, their, at their home place. Um, and so in terms of interacting with um, when the best time is to interact with, with uh, Johnson & Johnson or Big Pharma, I would say um, you know, begin your interactions as soon as possible. Start to build those relationships. One thing that, that we really value is the ability to um, to see what's coming through um, the very early pipeline, see what innovations are out there, um, but also to provide you know, feedback to, um, to the early innovators and, and, um, and to help them develop, um, develop a, a plan um, and a, a development program to move forward with, uh, provide them our insights. That helps the, the early innovator as well as it helps us when um, ultimately the goal uh, would be to, to license or exit, um, and so so that you know we um, get, you know as a large pharmaceutical company are um, are kind of seeing the the um, the results that we need in order to sell um, a transaction um, or an exit internally as well. Um, and I would say in turn in terms of um, you know what we'd be looking for, how to align the innovators. Um, uh, program with with what we're looking for, um, I would say you know obviously the the website is a, a one place to start, but then um, I would say dive in and, and do your research and understand, uh, look at our press releases, um, listen to our quarterly meetings, and uh, and really figure out how um, how your opportunity will fit in strategically with respect to um, what the big pharma is is you know, doing now and where they're going. Um, and you can do that through, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you can do that through, um, you know, talking to your KOLs, um, trying to understand the underpinnings of the, uh, of the unmet need um, and how that, will be, how that will all position with respect to um, the big pharma uh, strategy. Yeah. Fully yeah. agree with that, Colin. So go ahead. Um, I think uh, one thing that I would add to that is for uh, you to stay in touch with your BD uh, contacts, with your external innovation contacts, such as Colin, right? Um, I think the strategic priorities change over time, so it's nice to stay engaged and provide updates. So as and when things change for Big Pharma, you're there and ready to capitalize on the window of opportunity, right? 
and we appreciate staying in touch. We appreciate the dialogue. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would also encourage folks to <clears throat> engage early. I agree with everything that you said. Um, I do th think, though, you know, it's important to get out there, talk to people, network, start to build relationships. But as you do engage with pharma, you still, even if it's early, and it's okay to be early, it's okay if you're still developing things, but it still needs to be a relatively sophisticated uh, preparation or um, story, you know, including not just that I've got this really great science, but that I've got a real value proposition, an unmet need that I have a way to solve. So, you know, really understanding that full story, even in the early stages, so that you come off with a very sophisticated message, I think is important. Yeah, yeah. maybe just an anecdote on that. Yeah. Um, I received, a, uh, I received a, a, a pitch deck not too long ago um, where um, someone was convincing me of a, a $187 billion opportunity. <laughs> So, um, so that that's not terribly <laughs> useful. Um, maybe I mean so. So tell us how, you know, what part of that market are you going after, and how you plan on doing it. So taking it to that next level. Yeah. yeah. No, I think I think the only other thing I would add is I think, you know, having a crisp, clear, concise um, pitch of how your technology may be different or how your asset is differentiated. I do think uh, engaging early is is super important. It's not only built upon the science, but it's you know, a deal is built upon the relationships that you build, and those can't be done overnight. It takes a long time. Um, and then I think the, um, uh, just to echo what Colin said, I think also getting, getting that, that potential partner's feedback on what data or a small animal study or large animal study they would like to see and how it would be designed, right, can save a lot of time and money uh, because those types of animal studies are not inexpensive, um, and the last thing you want to do is, you know, plan a, you know, a non-human primate study, get to the end, and have data that you know you didn't ask the right question, right, or you didn't generate it the way a partner would have liked you to have generated it, and then you know you're kind of stuck after spending a million or two dollars and not having the data that you need to really support your your discussion. Those are all mm -hmm. fantastic points, and the perfect segue to my next question, which is. What should developers be sure to have absolutely nailed down in terms of their development, clinical, regulatory plans prior to engagement, even if early? And what are the most important elements to consider when preparing to have this early engagement with large pharma? I can start. Sure. Take yeah, it's kind of you know adds on to what we were already saying. Yeah. I think yeah. <clears throat> if you think about the story, so I think your question is more about you know how much data do you have to have. And as we said before, I think you don't have to have everything, um, but I think it's really important to know what your plan is. Um, and, and it's that whole story, as we've been talking about, starts with the unmet need, the value proposition, the science behind it, the innovation that's going to support it, um, but then also the regulatory strategy, the manufacturing strategy, you know, the go-to-market strategy. Um, how does it fit within the portfolio of the company that you're talking to? So it's kind of the bigger picture. And then really importantly, it's the plan. It's, um, you know, the resources you need, um, you know, in terms of studies to be done and costs to get to the next inflection point. And is that the inflection point you really want to engage the pharma company and be clear about that? Um, so I think it's, it's telling that sophisticated story and not leaving any gaps so, because even if you come in early and you say, well, it's still going to take me nine months to get to this in vitro proof of concept, um, you need to really lay out exactly um, what, what that plan is. And then I think you can be much more convincing. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, th I think the other thing I would, would add is, um, you know, certainly, certainly kind of knowing and articulating what you do know and also being very clear about what you don't know and what mm -hmm. you're looking to still prove. But I think it's also, you know, when you're speaking to, you know, whether it's Colin or, or whoever, right, is, is, is how can that partner help you achieve those goals as well? Because it's, it is a collaboration which is spent, meant to be a two-way street. It's not just mm -hmm. a typically a licensing out of, uh, especially in the technology area, right? If it's a NASA, you mm -hmm. may be kind of ex explicitly licensing it out and someone else has taken control of it. But in the earlier phase, it's really about how two parties can come together and, and advance a technology and be a win-win. So you know your product well, right? So really own up to any gaps that you have in development and speak to how you're going to bridge that gap. And if you need the big pharma to come in and fill that gap, that's okay too, right? Because 
I've seen cases where that's a great selling point where a big pharma is very uniquely positioned to either fill that gap or amplify that asset in some ways, right? And that's how a deal happens, for instance. So it's yeah. it's not a bad thing at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with all everything that's been said on the stage. Um, I think that, um, you know, what, what we would want to see, um, you know, as you develop your plans is we, we, we want to make sure that what you've done today is scientifically sound and robust and you haven't, you haven't skipped any steps. Um, but we also want to, um, knowing that um, a smaller partner wouldn't be able to take it all the way to commercialization, uh, we still want to hear your thoughts on, um, on how your opportunity would get there, right? Mm -hmm. what, um, what patient populations are you going after? Um, what's your strategy? What's your clinical? What do you think the clinical strategy should be? We may have different opinions, but um, but that's what the the big pharma is for. So it, it's not to, you know, don't be afraid to say something to um, to a, a larger partner um, just because you think it might be wrong. We'd like to hear your thoughts, um, and and we're here to help um, you advance your uh, opportunity along. So we're, we of course will have our own opinions. Um, so, um, but it would be good to understand what, what, um, what the small uh, or the biotech is thinking about in terms of getting it all the way to the market. Yeah, and the other thing I would just add to all of that is, you know, as you really engage a farmer partner, it's, it's important to define what the ask is. You know, are you here to potentially sell your company? Do you want to do a research collaboration, and how would that be set up? Do you, do you want to do a partnership? Do you want to out-license something? Mm -hmm. you know, what do you envision in terms of what the business deal would actually look like? I think a lot of times people really aren't sure of that, or they want to, they want to um, see how it might go. But I think it's important to have a pretty good yes. understanding, or at least you know, have thought through that question about, yeah, that, about what you want to do. That, that's, a re that's a really good point, yeah. Beth. Yeah. What is, it that, what is it that you are looking for? Um, what's, your, what's your ask? Um, and then what's sort of, you know, what you would live with, right? Um, and so understanding those, uh, those different questions, those ranges, helps you approach the, um, the partner with a clear plan on what it is that you want. And if it's not the right time to engage, that's, that, that's fine. Um, but if it is, then you'll be in a position where you can advance very quickly um, without any hiccups, because if, if you don't have that, um, that understanding of what it is that you want and you're not aligned with your board, um, there, there will be hiccups and, and there will be pauses. So. Thank you. That's a lot of very insightful and helpful advice um, for this team. Um, I think that one thing I'd like to end with is a success story from each of you. Um, and this is a lot of practical advice, um, but we'd love to hear how you've seen it actually play out in real life um, with an example that you've personally been involved with. Um, so we'll just start with that. Okay. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of different types of things through my career. Um, I guess what I'll talk about is the most recent thing. I was the chief business officer and head of operations for Renovacor, which was a temple spin out. Um, Renovacor was a cardiovascular gene therapy company and kind of an interesting story because um, you know, the company had a decent Series A um, funding that took it through some good, you know, preclinical work um, to get to the point where the company was ready for the next round of financing. And the way the financing was done was through a SPAC, so a Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation, if you're not familiar, a blank check company that is public and has a certain amount of funding. And by virtue of merging with um, a company like that, um, you take on the capital, but then you become public. Um, so Renovacor was actually a very tiny couple people, preclinical gene therapy company that you know, went through this round of financing and became public at that stage, which was a really interesting thing to be, as you can imagine, uh, in that preclinical stage. Um, and the company did great. Um, you know, we grew the, you know, the human resources, the people, the operations. We were progressing the um, programs through. And then coming to the point, you know, in 2022, thinking about sort of the, the strategy a little bit longer term and what the cash runway was going to look like and what's the best way to go about the next round of financing and when. And we decided to take on a um, strategy, um, as we talked about here, 
of looking to partner um, you know, with a pharma company, potentially bring in some cash, um, help with uh, you know, execution of the programs. And so we, we specifically went out to do that, and that turned into interest by a number of companies to acquire the company, um, which turned into a full-on formal acquisition process with the bank. And then in the end, um, the company was acquired by Rocket Pharma, another gene therapy company. So um, it was kind of a quick turnaround, but you know, the timing, you know, as, as our company came into what was becoming the financial crunch and thinking about what are the options for getting funding, um, that became a good option. It was a good exit for the company. A lot of the employees went on to, to work for Rocket, so that was my story. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I'll go next. So, um, so let's see. We we executed on a deal. Uh, I think in, in early 2021 with uh, with Remix Therapeutics. Um, so this is a, a, a small molecule um, RNA splicing modulator company. So real real early technology. Um, and uh, and for those of you who who know um, this space, uh, the chemistry around the, these um, uh, these splicing modulators is. Is fairly narrow, so obviously the uh, the company that we were um, that we were speaking with, uh, Remix, was um, of course concerned about um, about the chemical space and ownership and, and intellectual property, um, and so um, th this obviously was you know a, a key point in, in the negotiations, um, and so um, so I, I would say my success story was uh, convincing. Um, Johnson and Johnson to be more flexible in how they handled their approach to to IP ownership, given the, given this unique mm. chemical matter space, um, and and being able to handle it a little bit differently. Um, so um, so that just I think speaks to uh, the need for big pharmaceutical companies to under truly understand the science of what's going on with uh, with the innovators. Um, and understanding their issues at, at their level, um, and then being flexible in order to, to make the deal happen. Colin, you also have a great um, J Labs success story. And I know we've talked a lot about incubation and the importance of staying in the incubator. Um, can you just share really quickly the example that you provided earlier? Yeah, sure. Just, just briefly, I, I would say that, um, so this was one of, the, one of the first deals that we actually did. Uh, we started um, the uh, the innovation center about ten years ago. So this was one of the first first deals, and it was um, it was interesting that um, it leveraged um, pretty much all of J and J's offerings. So J Labs incubation, uh, JJDC investment. JJDC is our, our venture arm, um, and then the transaction. So these are the these are the three different um, these are the three different uh, types of offerings we bring to our, our innovators. Um, and so we, we incubated this company. Um, we got it to the point where, um, where we were able to spin it out from his parent company um, with an investment, and then we did a licensing deal with them. So it's, mm. we call it the trifecta. So. <laughs> that is a trifecta, indeed. Yeah. Um, I can speak about it. It's not a personal success story as much as I'm implementing some of it, but uh, Bayer has this model called the arm's length model that we are employing with a lot of our subsidiary companies. So the way it operates, and essentially the point is to keep the innovative culture alive, right, from uh, what you uh, acquire from biotech. So when we close the acquisition, we set it up such that they have a, and they stay really separate, right? They have their own emails, they retain their own branding. Um, and they, we pre-negotiate a FITS budget, and there are milestones that pay out at uh, predefined uh, time points. And uh, the way we govern is we sit on the board, and then the biotech has its own uh, representatives on the board as well. And now we've also uh, started having third-party members on the board. Uh, so that's really, you know, th that's the way we govern, and there is no day-to-day -day interference in how they operate. Um, and. I think what this is really led to, and we're doing this right now with Blue Rock, Ask Bio, Vivian, three recent acquisitions that Bayer did. We've really been able to keep that innovation alive. Um, you know, you don't have big pharma shackles <laughs> slowing you down, uh, bureaucracy slowing you down. So that's been working quite well for Bayer. Um, I'll probably go with the obvious one, which is the acquisition by, uh, of Spark by, by Roche. Um, <laughs> So it should be near and dear to everybody in this room, uh, being here in Philadelphia. So I think, from my perspective, it was you know uh, 
a huge win on a number of fronts. One, um, for patients, right, and being in the, uh, being part of a, a global organization like Roche that can fund a technology like gene therapy from beginning to end. Um, as we've just been talking through this entire panel, right, the access to capital and um, is, is, is tight um, and ebbs and flows over the life cycle of a, of a program. And so having a stable source of that was incredibly important. Um, for, um, for organizations like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who was the founding shareholder in, in Spark, that meant um, returning to them three quarters of a billion dollars um, that they can plow back into uh, patient care and research. Um, and so that was a, a huge win for uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And then lastly, Philadelphia um, proper, right? I think um, when, uh, when we started Spark back in 2012, 2013, uh, we're probably one of the first companies in the biotech space to decide to headquarter in, in West Philadelphia um, and now just drive across the bridge and you've got 40 or 50 gene therapy companies, cell therapy companies uh, in West Philly. And you've got now um, Roche, Spark making a half a billion dollar investment in a 500,000 square foot gene therapy center of excellence uh, right in West Philadelphia. So that was a, a huge win for, uh, for, for Philadelphia, for patients, for, um, for nonprofits here in the, in the city. Absolutely. Um, well, I think in conclusion, I just wanted to thank you all for an incredibly insightful discussion highlighting the trends, strategies, tools, and best practices required to create unique partnerships. Um, we need to address the evolving landscape of drug development and commercialization, and through partnerships and strategies, this is how we'll get it done. Um, these valuable partnerships will enable the pooling of resources, expertise, and technologies, which will ultimately lead to the development of more effective, innovative therapies accessible to all. It is certainly an exciting time as partnerships will continue to grow in importance as the industry strives to meet the increasing demands for personalized and precision medicine. Thank you all very much. Okay. So I was glad to hear you speak a little bit about patients. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and That's I just good. wonder, I guess, in all this deal making, like all of this usually starts with some, you know, really altruistic idea of wanting to solve a problem, somebody who's sick, who has something they didn't ask for. And, um, you know, I think about like gene therapy being, you know, a cure for somebody being born with something they didn't ask for being $3 million. So I'm just wondering, because I'm not on the business side, in all this deal making, is the patient ever centered? Does it ever help <laughs> to not just talk about money? Oh, oh absolutely, <laughs> yeah. from, our, from my perspective. I mean, it's one of the reasons um, I'm in the biotech space. It's one of the reasons I stayed in the gene therapy space, because of the, the profound effect that we've seen that Gene therapy as an entire modality can have, whether it was you know, curing a child's blindness with uh, Luxterna from, from Spark or the hemophilia programs, both hemophilia B and hemophilia A that have been approved that basically make patients you know, cured of their disease. Right? I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, so I use cured with the small c. Um, but uh, but it's, it's incredibly important. And you know, I think one of the things that we think about often um, in the deal-making space is how can we move it faster to get to patients faster? Mm -hmm. And the other example I was gonna use from a success story was um, uh, our decision at Spark to uh, partner all the ex-US rights for Luxterna to Novartis, right? And that was mm -hmm. largely driven by the fact that it would take forever for a company Spark size at that time to build all of the global infrastructure necessary to commercialize a drug like that around the world. And so the fastest way to patients was to find somebody that had those capabilities throughout the world. And so that, that was a huge driving yeah. force. I couldn't yeah, agree more, yeah. Please go ahead. Oh. No, I couldn't agree more, and I'm so glad you asked the question that way, because I guess, you know, sitting on the stage talking about deals and money, perhaps you get the impression, you know, that it's all about deal-making and business development people, but just like, you know, you know uh, Joe was saying, um, that's what we're all driven by. Yeah. And business development or partnerships or deals financing or all of it is all part of how we make this, you know, ecosystem work um, because you've got to, you know, have the funding and you've got to get some return on investment for your investors to be able to make things happen. But yep. to me, 
you know, close to my heart, it's all about, you know, how do we bring new therapies to patients in need? Yeah, yeah we're, we're all talking about operationalizing how to bring innovation forward to the patient. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, I mean, the message may get diluted, but the underpinning of all this is the patient and the level of innovation um, that, that we want to bring. We're not looking for the next Me Too. We're, not, we're, not, we're mm -hmm. looking for significant, impactful therapies that will add value to lives. So, so um, um, and, and if you take a look at you know, Johnson & Johnson's credo, so we have a credo, you can go on the website. First sentence um, is all about the patients. So in everything that we do, um, the first thing that we're thinking about is how are, we, how are we going to bring value to patients and how are we going to get there? So what you've heard today is how do we get there? <laughs> we have a J-Pod here. We have a J-Pod here. <laughs> yeah, and I think one thing to, to keep in mind too is that we're either patients ourselves. I'm personally a cancer survivor. My sister's a cancer survivor. I lost my father to melanoma and my nephew at 10 to Ewing sarcoma. We're all doing this because we're personally impacted in some way, shape, or form. Either ourselves, family members, friends, neighbors, colleagues. We're all trying to work towards the same goals. We just happen to choose pathways in business to try to get these therapies to market faster. Um, there's a lot of physician scientists that go into business. There's a lot of business people that follow their hearts into science. And I think that you know, having the patients front and center is incredibly important, which is why Nancy made it a point to invite um, the patient voice into this forum. So thank you for the question, and um, thank question. you all for your attention to our yeah. panel. Yeah,